to everyone so much for joining us today. This is our third conversation on senior living solutions, and today we're going to focus on in-home care. I'm Jeff Sand. I'm a financial advisor with the uh, Raccoon Group here in Santa Fe, and for our topic today, we're real fortunate to have a couple of professionals that were uh, having to join us, Jennifer Reek with Aegis and Patrick Salas with Ember Care. I'll give you a little more information on them in, in just a moment. First, I want to give just a little bit of background on the history of these conversations that we're offering and how it came about was that we had a number of clients around a similar time period that talked to us about that they were experiencing some challenges in their home and they recognized that they needed to either have some assistance in the home or maybe to consider looking at a different environment for them. And so at that time, we reached out to a couple professionals here in town, Karen Powers and Allison Nathan, and they assisted us. The first conversation we had was just a, a basic overview of the different things you can consider ranging, starting with aging in place at home, and then independent living at uh, assisted living facilities that then also different services as well, up to memory care and skilled memory facilities or skilled nursing facilities. And then the second conversation we had was where we looked in more detail for those individuals that said, okay, I'm ready to let go of my house. How do I go about, how do I go about researching and identifying um, a facility and a community that I'd like to be a part of. And so that's what we focused on for the second conversation. And both of those are available on our website as well. And so then now we're circling back to the idea of in-home care. So this is where uh, individuals are identifying, maybe they might need some assistance with medication management. Maybe they need some physical assistance with just basic things of getting going, dressing, maybe bathing, things like that. But how do you how do you find resources to to assist you with that, even once you you identify it? And so once again, we're really, really fortunate to have a couple of professionals in this area to join us again. We have Jennifer Reek and Jennifer is the uh, business development manager for Aegis. And I remember I shared with Jennifer that I was also uh, friends with Jeff Pine that had started Aegis and and that. Uh, symbol came from elders getting information and services. And um, so Aegis is a great uh, organization here in town. They provide some services, but even if they don't have specific things to offer that that an individual might need, they're, they're great at navigating the different resources out there and they can help people with that. And then also Patrick Salas is joining us and Patrick is the executive director of Amber Care in Northern New Mexico. Patrick's also a registered nurse and he has quite an extensive background in, in healthcare. And he and I got to know each other and be, become friends when we were both on the board of a nonprofit here in Santa Fe, Coming Home Connection, which focuses on providing care in, in home for folks. And so uh, thank you both so much for, for joining us today. And let's see, so here's where, where we start at. Um, well, someone, let's say someone identifies they need some, need some help. And so you get an initial call that says, what, what do I do? How about, uh, Jennifer, how about if I, I just start with you? How do you take the call? How do you help direct someone to identify some of their needs? So typically a care manager will actually receive that call um, when the inquiry comes and they will do a, a quick 15 minute dialogue and ask certain questions of like, you know, what are they looking for, their expectations? Um, and they go from there. And when they set that appointment, they'll actually do an in-person visit. And then that's where they do that in-depth assessment and evaluation. And they'll go through a litany of, of questions of, you know, of, of reviewing the client and looking at the home and seeing what that care plan is going to look like with all those questions that they, they go through. And that's a long list. It's pretty comprehensive. So it takes about an hour to go through. 
But, um, and from there, they, they create the care plan. So they ask a, quite a few questions. They can, they can tell what the client already needs by, by you know, the clutter or the mess um, in the home, um, their mobility, uh, you know, are they walking well? Um, are they repeating themselves? What their cognition level looks like and so forth in a nutshell. It can go long, but. Yeah, okay. So then uh, thanks for that introduction. How about Patrick? Similar for you at AmberCare, you just receive an initial call. Is that sound similar of just it, trying to diagnose what their situation is? It does. And being part of the AmberCare family of companies, um, we have the beauty of having home health and personal care services uh, that we're able to collaborate with under one umbrella. So as that call comes in, uh, our intake coordinators are very astute at being able to tease out certain of those things. Are they falling a lot? A lot of recent hospitalizations. Um, are they sleeping a lot? Are they not eating? And so that, you know, because I'm hospice, uh, of course, that's how where we start to um, move them toward the hospice side. But also patients and families are calling in just sometimes for that information. And then we're able to tease those um, intricacies out. And then we say, well, you probably need home health. Maybe you just broke your hip, you know, coming home, you need some support there and or uh, maybe personal care services. So it's a true collaborative effort on our side. Um, but back to Jennifer's point, it's about a 15 minute process, getting that information, getting those questions answered, asked and answered, and then coming back to the table and then passing that off to the rest of us and saying, okay, how do we get the right resources to the right patient at the right time? Okay, and then this, I just had this thought too, where um, what if it's a, a family member calling you, how do you help them identify that it's time? <laughs> well, and th that's, the, that's the beauty of, of, of the work that we're able to do is, um, especially on the hospice side is asking those questions of, um, and you can hear it in their voice. I mean, you know, if somebody's essentially fearful over the phone, uh, maybe they're completely overwhelmed. Uh, but there again, it's that dialogue and those, those key questions to be able to see. And then what we also like to do is um, our, our community liaison and talent data lip. We like to get him as a face-to-face -face encounter with those patients or those families to immediately. So, I mean, as we get that inf those questions asked, we send someone out to them and say, okay, can we meet with you face-to-face go over what we can offer, how we can offer that, and then the ball just starts rolling from there. Okay, you, you've both helped me um, remember and identify that. So often, uh, for everyone listening, it's so important to, to, to get started, to try and create a plan, because we're all so guilty of waiting for the crisis. And, and then when we, when we have the crisis, then you've got the added stress of trying to make decisions and it's, it, it makes it even, even harder that way. Um, one of the things that, that we have on our, we have kind of a basic agenda, we're gonna make sure we touch on some of these points today. One of them is, is looking at first identifying what's referred to as activities of daily living or ADLs. And so maybe if whoever would like to share what, what are those things, and then later we'll contrast that with uh, uh, the instrumental activities of daily living. So we can just kind of share that information with people listening today. Jennifer, go ahead. You're the, okay. you're the one that educated me on this yeah. first. So we have ADLs, which is activities of daily living, and then there's instrumental activities of daily living. And the most common six ADLs are your um, mobility or ambulating, um, your eating, your bathing and grooming, your washroom needs, and then transfer. And transfer means like positioning a body from sitting up to standing up, going from bed to chair um, or wheelchair to the washroom and back. So those are your basic ADLs. And think of everything we do to do self-care. Um, on a daily basis. And then the IADLs is really more of the complex thinking and organization skills like driving, 
um, medication reminders, scheduling your doctor's appointments, um, money management, um, things of that nature. That takes much more thinking is what we call the instrumental ADLs. And there's usually some common ones like ones I just mentioned, but it's a longer list than your basic ADLs. So those are the two uh, uh, sets of ADLs that we work with. And I'm sure Patrick obviously has probably more to share about that. Um, yeah, yes, thank you, Jennifer. I'm, I'm glad that you, you, you broke those up in those two, two uh, distinct categories. Um, and, and I'll, uh, because I'm hospice, I'm always gonna go to that, you know, to that, to that skill set. Um, mm -hmm. Hospice has a very, very um, negative connotation in our society, in our cultures, and even in our healthcare delivery system, because um, hospice has this um, paradigm that we come in, we stop all of your medications, you can go see your doctors, <laughs> put you on all these narcotics, and we make you go to sleep, and that's it. And um, that's exactly the exact, exact opposite of what hospice does. So the hospice benefit is designed and the criteria is if a patient has a, a terminal diagnosis, terminal illness of six months or less. And we like our patients to be able to have benefit from our interdisciplinary teams, which is physicians, registered nurse care, nurse case managers, certified nurse assistants, medical social workers, chaplains, and volunteers we like that team to be able to come in and support the patient and their family in their home or their, their residence of their choice for a minimum of six months. Now, the average um, um, benefit that a patient is on in hospice is because patients and families of that negative connotation, when they come onto hospice, we think about that. How, how long do you think if the benefit is a minimum of six months, what do you think they're, they're on hospice for? How many? How long? What's the duration? A couple of weeks. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, less than four days. Less than four days. I, I have personal experience with that. My, my father-in-law was in Phoenix and he was, um, shall we say, stubborn. And so he insisted on being in, in his home. And so by the time we, we called and, and got resources, they, they came out and they said, Normally, we would create a plan with you, but there's no time. We're taking him straight to the hospice center, and he passed away two days later. So I, I, um, my experience is consistent with what you just said. Yeah. And, and the thing about also is we come in with the mentality of you can graduate off hospice. And the first benefit period, the first two benefit periods, and these are CMS, you know, Centers for Medicare Guidelines. The first two benefit periods are two 90-day benefit periods. The first benefit period, we expect you to get better with our care. We expect you to get better with our focus. We expect you to get better if we're able to partner with Aegis to get caregivers into the home. You know, you're going to get better and we expect that. And then if you eventually you know, pro you know, progress into the second benefit period, um, and you're still declining, well, then you, you, you've had all of these resources in their home, this supplemental care that's in the home. However, um, if the longer that you wait, you don't get to benefit from all that, that, you know, that you've been able to essentially, you know, you deserve. And so we want patients, and if they, if they graduate off of hospice, that's a win-win, right? Sure. And if they don't, we're able to be able to support them spiritually, um, making those difficult decisions about funeral homes, you know, cremation versus, you know, you know burial. All of those intricate questions have to be asked. And then we start preparing the patient and the family for that journey, especially as the patient starts to decline. Uh, th thanks very much. Um, I wanted to, uh, when we first talked about having initial conversations, you have care managers then that help assess the situation. I wanted to talk next about the care providers. So the ones that are going to be coming into the home 
and how do you um, how do you train your folks? How do you find your people? And uh, people want to know who who is it who is it that's going to actually come into the home to assist? And and before I do that, I'm, I'm sorry I meant to mention this earlier. For people listening, you're you're welcome to to um, send us questions at any time, and and we'll try and address those as well. Okay, thanks. So so caregivers. Do you want me to go on that one? Sure. Okay. So how Aegis is set up, we have care managers and then we have caregivers. And the caregivers are the ones that are going into the home um, that are hands-on and they're the ones that are bathing and, and grooming and meal prepping and then doing light housekeeping. So they're doing actually the hands-on working with um, what we call clients in the home. And um, the care manager oversees the caregiver and they do more of the administration, more of the overseer, and they're the ones that do the assessment and evaluation and, and create the care plan. And then the care plan is given to the, the caregiver to, of course, implement and assist. And I'm assuming the care plan then is going to identify, is this uh, a couple hours a day? Is this 24 hours a day? Um, something like that. It depends on what the client wants and where they are um, in their health situation. So they may choose only so many hours a week. They may choose um, eight to 12 hours overnight, 24 seven. So that's right. the client and what their needs are. And <clears throat> also obviously, you know, what they can afford to, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for the most part that we follow what the client wants and what they're looking and what their expectation of care from us is. Now, let me just say this, Aegis is a non-medical home care. So we do quarterly trainings for our caregivers and we try to cover the boat, the basic like CNA um, a syllabus per se. Um, but however, because we're non-medical, um, we are not required to have licensed medical caregivers, obviously, or even care managers. Now, we do um, want, you know, maybe an RN or a social worker um, as a care manager. But as for the caregivers, because we're non-medical, we don't require that. And Patrick will probably be able to speak a little bit more on his setup because obviously home health and hospice are medical. So that's that's his world. But for us, um, we are we're, we're set up a little bit different. Okay, so what if, like, like Aegis, what if you have to assist someone with uh, medical management? Do you have a resource for that as well? Yes, so we have RNs that are on our roster, and okay. so we work and we will outsource and we will also work with their, you know, the client's primary um, physician, so, and their, their clinicians and who, wh whoever they're working with. So the care manager is always in communication um, with their setup of medical um, you know, partners that they're working with. So yes, we definitely will tag team with them. And okay. And then uh, Patrick, is that similar for you? Is like, uh, and, and is Amper Care, like you just shared information with us about hospice services, but I, I, I think you also have in-home care as well? We do. We have personal yeah. care services, um, okay. which is um, like Jennifer, the same, same service line that Jennifer um, is, is involved with. Um, being amber care all of our individuals are licensed they're certified and they're credentialed uh, because we are providing you know health care services in, into that so all of our certified nurse assistants have to be certified obviously by the name they're certified mm -hmm. um, they have to go through the state program they have to pass the same um, exam testing in order to meet those minimum requirements and then as far as amber care is concerned uh, we have monthly, quarterly, and annual competencies in order to ensure that they are meeting the minimum standards. And now, of course, for us, Ambercare, we have a such higher standard um, as far as on that clinical side. Um, and so that's one of the um, facets that I oversee of being a registered nurse, but also being an administrator is being able to ensure that, that we have the right people um, on the bus providing the best care to our patients and their families. Yes. Can I go ahead and read? I'm seeing one of the questions that's been sent in already. And so this was uh, asking for like a specific situation in home care after major surgery, um, getting services, getting help for that. But then also a question of, of in this example, would long-term care 
uh, be applicable to to assist with with this cost long-term care insurance yeah yes so <clears throat> for example um, the only two method of payments that he just takes is private pay and long-term care insurance and more than not any long-term care insurance will cover home care but you do have to look at your policy very mm -hmm. carefully and to see what that looks like um, so so in long and short of it, yes, long-term care insurance does cover home care. Yeah, no, okay. I'll, I'll jump in on that. You really have to look at your policy writers when you're signing up to ensure what you're paying for, mm -hmm. you're going to be able to benefit from when you need it. And, and there's a lot of, lot, of, lot of policies out there, just like car insurance policies, home insurance policies. As you know, you know every, people call us all the time, well, I have long-term care insurance. So then our social workers come in, we start delving into the policy and it's like, no, this is not covered or this isn't. And it's so, it's, um, it's so disheartening because um, it's very expensive in order to be insure that, to, to, to be able to make that happen and then when you need it, it's not there as that safety net that you were hoping to have the whole time. But absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, frustrating there. Um, uh, let's see, another question that was posed is medical power of attorney versus guardianship or conservatorship um, when using assisted living or home services, can, can you help um, people clarify what what are those things? How do they help? How can they uh, benefit from having those in place? Go ahead, Jennifer. Oh, thank you. Okay. So medical power of attorney, um, from how I understand it, I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible because it can be very complex. But medical um, power of attorney uh, does play into the, the in-home care. So like, for example, when we get a call, and they are looking at in-home in care services, usually they'll have someone already lined up to be their medical POA or, and, and or financial POA. Um, if they don't, um, we recommend that they do sooner than later. But typically from my understanding, medical POA, you choose who you want your representative to be, which is called the agent. And then the, the person that's asking for it is the, the principal, which is the, the protective person. And then financial power of attorney, the same. Obviously, financial covers the financial decisions. Medical covers only the healthcare decisions. And that does come into play because, so for example, um, we are taking care of someone right now and their uh, person is deciding whether they need to put them in the assisted living. They are now have control. They have the decision to help that person to, to, to follow that process and what that looks like. You know, if they're cognitive, even though they may be their medical power of attorney, if they're still cognitive, they can still make their decisions. But until they become incapacitated, then that's when it becomes active. And, and pretty, much, pretty much the financial POA is somewhat the same way. Um, guardianship and conservatorship is it's when there is no one appointed and guardianship is um, going to going to be court process and court appointed. Same ah. thing for the conservatorship. And they so conservatorship parallels or is somewhat synonymous, as they say, to the financial POA and the guardianship is synonymous somewhat to the medical POA. Um, so uh, there's dynamics on different levels of that. We at each is only do medical and financial, then we outsource anybody who needs a guardian conservatorship. Um, if there's not one pointed, then it goes to the courts and then, you know, and it's up to the courts to decide. And that's a lengthy process in, in itself. Um, yes. What else was part of the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> Did I answer that? <laughs> yeah, that, that was it. And thanks for making the distinction because I hadn't thought previously about guardianship conservatorship is is you have to get involved with the legal process mm -hmm. and so that that's very helpful um yeah patrick you have other thoughts or experiences with medical power of attorneys and well and just to underscore it's it's when the patient is no longer decisional and they're right. not cognizant mm -hmm. so you could have a medical power of attorney you could be a power of attorney or if you know, you, you just can't make decisions for someone that is still able to be make those decisions for them. Right. And we do have those instances where that where, where that fine line gets to be a little blurred. Mm -hmm. and, 
that's what we're in and we're able to to um, be much more um, forthright with those individuals that have been and sometimes we have to change those sometimes it's it's not conducive to the current environment for that patient and so then it's like okay well we need to change that out and that's where our social workers come in and and they're able to make that happen so but it's a very fine line it's a fine line and it's a, it's a delicate balance um, mm -hmm. because because you think about that you know you think i'm gonna i'm gonna set you up as a medical power attorney and i want you to be able to make those decisions well sometimes those decisions are very very difficult mm -hmm. and and um it's always best to have that third party not um, a family member in our experience or someone that is as close to you as a patient to be able to be much more objective and to follow the patient's wishes and or their desires, um, especially in, at that as the end of life nears, because you want to make sure that those things are maintained and that sanctity of what their desire was. Exactly. Okay, thank you. That was a great uh, distinction that never occurred to me before, that, that as a third party you're going to perhaps be a bit more removed where if it's a family member it's it's going to be more stressful and, and difficult so uh, thanks that that and you can occurred, set up i mean I, i'll tell experience in, in my neighborhood I, um my 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 street alone is is a, is a much more mature neighborhood mm -hmm. and, and so i've been placed as medical power attorney for my my neighbors and mm -hmm. we we baked in there um because their kids live in other states um, right. We baked in some of those agreements that I will make decisions based on this criteria until the first child shows up. Mm -hmm. And then once the first child shows up, then I relinquish that control to the next medical power of attorney. Exactly. But I'm also keeping safeguard of what my neighbor wanted and how they wanted to go about. And mm -hmm. did they want artificial uh, life support? Did they want to be on a ventilator? Did they want, you know, all those intricacies, um, and then you can you can tease all those things out the way that you need them. But it's always best to have that that third party to be able to say, okay, I want to follow what you desired. I feel good about it. Yeah, I I, I like that, and, and that parallels like in our office here. Uh, oftentimes, we're the uh, financial power of attorney, and then after some clients have passed away most commonly the children are scattered across the country and so it's it's been much much easier for us to coordinate f on their behalf to coordinate things for them um because we're we're right here where all the other things are that ne need to be looked at um what if we would look at next um if we look at maybe just some of the the rates and payment methods what the phrase that was used earlier too was was private pay and just to to share with you too when we previously talked uh with the other conversations about assisted living and skilled nursing what it really came down to is primarily private pay that that there were um a few narrow instances where someone might be eligible for a va benefit or something but um most people are not going to fall into those those things and so uh help us understand what what are the payment options and what are maybe typical rates going to be for different levels of, of service so i can go on that um so from what i see and know and how aegis operates um, the range of rates for home care agencies in our market and of course it's going to vary you know, uh, market to market and agency to agency, but the average give or take could be from 25 an hour to upwards to 40 an hour. Um, there's restrictions for some home care agencies. Um, so the restrictions could be a three hour minimum to mm -hmm. four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, some agencies have, if you do so many hours, it's this rate. If you have you know, minimum, it's this rate. If you have a, what they call um, a, a differentiator from a weekday rate versus a weekend rate. Our agency, for example, is a flat rate um, just for the home care giving. So there's, those are the variables that we see here in our market um, for the most part. And then again, it's private pay for us, and then it's um, long-term care insurance. Some home care agencies will do VA benefits um, and do Department of Labor 
Um, mm -hmm. I should say, I should add on for Aegis, we do also Department of Labor and their white card is a benefit card and it will cover home care services. But again, they have to go through the process through their authorized agent, be qualified, et cetera. And then once it's approved, then we get that information and we can start services. But I'm, you're I'm gonna not see I'm not familiar with that Department of Labor. So it's usually people who have worked at, let's say, the Sandia Labs or Los Alamos Labs. Yeah. And their um, their white card will give them the benefit to have home care. But however, the caveat is their work has to have caused health issues down the down the road, cancer, Parkinson's. Oh, oh okay. Lyme disease. Okay. So now it's I'm... not it's not just because you worked at the lab, you get it automatically. You have to go through a process and an illness has to take place and the cause has to be what they did for the lab. Um, okay. in a nutshell, in an easy right. way to explain it. Um, um, obviously it's more in depth than that, but but the long and short of it. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. And then how about for cost pricing and structures at uh, Amber Care, Patrick? So uh, the hospice benefit, commercial plan or centers for Medicare, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, so I'm gonna say for our patient populations, 98% of patients that are on hospice are covered by a government plan, a Medicare or a Medicaid plan. Really? Yes. Wow. Um, and, and you think about that, especially on the Medicare side, uh, you paid into your benefit, um, you know, this was enacted in, in the late early 80s. And, 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 and I'm so, how should I say, I'm so proud of the benefit. I would like it to be expanded to be able to encompass more. However, the benefit covers um, all medications that are related to your qualifying admitting diagnosis, all the durable medical equipment, hospital bed, oxygen, wheelchair, uh, bedside commode. Um, then all of the care, physician, registered nurse case manager, medical social worker, chaplain, volunteer, bereavement support for 13 months after, all of that is 100% covered. Um, the caregiving, and that's why we partner um, with, with our other agencies is um, because it's not, and I would love for the hospice benefit too. So for those people out there that, that you know, have really good relationship with your representatives and your senators. I mean, that's where we, we need the next evolution of our hospice benefit is to is to be able to be expanded into cover caregiving that's paid in the home because we're supplemental care. Mm -hmm. um, however, the hospice benefit period, um, like I said, it's covered with all of those entities and it's all rolled up into that. And it doesn't come at a cost or a copay to the patient or the family member. That, that was, I've, I've referenced earlier, my, my late father-in-law, and that was our experience too, that absolutely everything was covered and it was just exceptional care that, that he had experienced too. Um, let me see, we have a number of questions coming in. Let's see, um, the next one I'm going to read is, is uh, someone talking about uh, how do you go about moving an elderly parent uh, from another state to Santa Fe in order to receive care, is there any um, challenge or problem or is there recipro reciprocity between states for insurance and legal concerns? I just think you have to know what New Mexico state requirements are, um, but usually our care managers, when they receive that call, they can walk them through that process and then, then we work with, you know, um, other referral sources that will guide us too as well. Um, but, you know, we just had one not too long ago. She brought her, her loved one from Dallas, Texas. It mm -hmm. didn't seem, you know, all that complicated. You know, she has to do her due diligence. If she wants someone like us to help with alternate living options and find what their requirements are, um, then we can help and assist or they can do it themselves. But um, they just can reach out to the different age, uh, different living centers, and then just kind of see what their requirements are, and what that looks like. And then also what the state of New Mexico uh, processes for their side of medical and financial, all that fun stuff. So I think it's just a matter of just finding those resources, and then they will guide them. Okay, so I'm glad to hear you already have experience with with that situation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, let me see. Do, 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 do. No, I'll, I'll just to underscore that um, it, it, it's having those medical social workers um, 
on staff um, employed by your facilities um, with us, it's it's mandatory that we have them because there's that's their specialty is to be able to wade through all of that bureaucratic red tape paperwork and be able to say, okay, here's this, here's your insurance. Now, you know, Medicare is universal, you know, for us. So it doesn't matter if patient has Medicare benefits, they're traveling from state to state. It did they just transfer over. It's it just it's seamless. Um, mm -hmm. Private insurance is a different um, entity, but those individuals are adept at being able to maneuver through that and, and you know, tease all those things out. Jeff, can I assist with the questions? Absolutely, please. Okay, so we had one come in early um, and we will be, I, I don't recall if you mentioned this, we're having another panel next month on uh, specifically on care for dementia and um, people who, family members or patients who are dealing with dementia and care around that. But this question was um, about those who might not have families who are experiencing dementia, uh, might not have families or financial resources. Um, what is available to them? in terms of any type of care. So this would be like if a, a friend were to call on right. out of concern for, let's say, a neighbor that they recognize they're having right. or, uh, memory or I, loss. Um, yeah. uh, deliver with kitchen angels. Mm -hmm. And you know they often are the eyes sometimes on the ground, uh, kitchen angels or the people in the office who understand that something is shifted. Mm -hmm. um, and so they might even be, I could imagine, someone who would say, okay, some additional help is needed here. You can always reach out to the Dementia um, Alzheimer's organization, and they can walk you through that process, and they're the experts on that. And typically, that's where Aegis um, will reach out to, because that, obviously, that's not in our wheelhouse. I mean, we, we work with it, but we work with other organizations, such as them, um, to guide us as well. Um, so is that a national organization uh -huh. and there's one here in Santa Fe too there's one in okay. Albuquerque and Beth Hamilton is the contact and she's the expert that we rely mm -hmm. on and we actually just defer everything to her so um, and then that she can equip um, them with answers okay thank you I didn't I didn't know that existed yeah oh, yeah we also use uh, David Davis he's the executive director for the Member Care Alliance Mm. Um, and I'll throw his number out. He's 505-310-9752. He's another tremendous resource. Um, yes, yeah. yes. Um, and you can also make those calls to us. I mean, you could you could call into um, Ambercare and we can also assist getting you hooked up with the correct person. But those two, Beth Hamilton, David Davis, um, yeah, phenomenal individuals. Um, their commitment to their community is unmatched. That's really helpful. Thank you. I think we've partly answered this question, but uh, it's a two-parter. Is the initial call that one makes um, in terms of payment and getting things, you know, helping to get things set up to their long-term care insurer or provider? And then for home services, the second question, are there adequate employees available um, or is there a long wait period right now for home health care or in-home care? Um, do you want me to go? Yeah, Jennifer, you go first on everything. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in regards to the um, way, we have about 150 caregivers, so we're pretty, wow. pretty fast. Wow. And right now, we can pretty much turn it pretty quickly. Um, it, of course, flows back and forth. It just depends. But um, for right now, we're doing pretty good, and we can turn it around. Um, in regards to, um, I'm sorry, Karen, what was the part other of the question? I apologize. The, it was, is, is one's long-term care insurer sort of the first point of contact in terms of payment? Is it better? I think what the question probably is asking is, do we start with Medicare? Do we start with long-term care? You know, where do you begin to um, look at how you're going to pay for okay. the services? Well, typically, if they come to us, um, obviously, like I said earlier, that we don't, you know, we do private pay and long-term care insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, we recommend if you know you're going to need it, start the process, submit the claim. Mm -hmm. The family member can submit that claim or whoever's, you know, in charge um, for that loved one. And we can do it for, unfortunately, a fee, but we can start the process for them. And so the first step is a claim and the submission. 
And then typically for some long-term care insurance company, it's pretty immediate, but a lot of times it's not. It's a 30, 60, 90 day wait period. So that's why if you know and you see something foreshadowing and you know that's gonna happen, quickly start that process. And like I said, we can do the heavy lifting or the loved one can do the, the mm-hmm. you know, the, the steps to, to get it going. And then once it's, you know, up and going, then, then we can start services pretty quickly. Um, however, a caveat to LTC, from my understanding, is they do have to meet a requirement of either two or three mm-hmm. ADLs out of the six. So they need to look at their policy and that policy is going to guide them to let them know. Or if we're doing the heavy lifting, we will let them know. Mm-hmm. So what that looks like. And as long as they're qualified and they, they are, they're meeting that, that criteria, then all is good. And then that's pretty much the s- simple setup of it on our end. Do you have anything yes, additional to add, Patrick? Yeah, Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, caregiving is not covered under that. It's not a benefit. Um, long-term care and another thing that like I said there's so many plans out there but one thing to ask is how soon can I start to access my benefits when I need them because Jennifer's right sometimes it's 30 days sometimes it's 60 sometimes it's 90 Um, there's a lot of uh, modifiers in those plans and and unfortunately and most most people when they sign up for them they're not thinking about that because it's like, oh, what's long-term care insurance? I should be able to, I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to be able to draw on it when I need it. And then when you go to need it, then it's like, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. And so it's um, it, it's very disheartening, very disheartening. So it's best to, bet, best to get the information. Yeah, I had and to, I'll to add, clarify. Sorry, Jeff, I'll add for people that we work with in terms of our clients, um, we, this is one of the services that we provide in terms of helping speak with long-term care, particularly if we're listed as a third party, um, authorized third party on someone's policy, we can call, we can submit forms, we can ask a lot of questions that are needed as well. Jeff has a long history of, of assisting clients in this way. I've been assisting a lot of clients in this way. So, so that is one of the things that we do. Um, I think a, a really interesting question around all of this is what if you're receiving, um, and again, some of this is Medicare, so um, not necessarily pertinent to Aegis, but, and Patrick, if I understand you correctly, it's not pertinent to the caregiving, but is to the hospice, that if you're receiving coverage through a spouse's Medicare plan, um, and the spouse um is predeceases the non-covered person, do you know if the Medicare of the deceased spouse transfers over to the non-Medicare spouse? And I guess in this case, would that just be for hospice? It's that survivor benefit, and they would have to look at how that's also set up um, with Medicare. So that there again, that's something else that- Is I that could, a, that's a choice, right? There are different- this, Yes, yeah. there, there is a choice. Okay. Um, However, but there is that survivor benefit that does that comes into play, and so yes, the the spouse is covered on that non you know non Medicare. Yes. Okay, and I will let people who are attending or or watching the replay know uh, that we're hoping to provide a Medicare specific. Um, panel or uh, presentation in the next couple of months, uh, there's an organization that we have connected with called Chapter, uh, who actually, for any of you who've been on here previously and heard how Allison Nathan works with her service with assisted living, Chapter does a very similar thing in that they will um, work with individuals who are looking at their Medicare eligibility, trying to get signed up, and they'll help you find the carrier who's the right fit. Um, And they'll actually take you through the process, make sure you have the right forms, make sure you're getting everything submitted. So they will be able to provide, uh, and they'll talk about all of the different Medicare plan A, plan B, all of that. So we'll have a more comprehensive Medicare uh, conversation in the future. I love that. One of the other um, second part of one of the questions was, um, uh, Jennifer, you shared that you have a large number of care providers, but uh, if someone were to call, do you have capacity? Is there a wait? Um, how, how, How are you both set up? For us, for now, there's not a wait. Um, 
So we can pretty much turn it on quickly. I think it, but it also depends on when the call comes in <laughs> too, I think for a home care agency. So typically if someone calls us on a Thursday and they, I, I literally had a call literally from, matter of fact, from Amber Care, because we work really well with them um, when it comes to hospice, uh, their clients, but um, literally uh, they wanted that night that was a little tough because they called me at five and they wanted like in the next hour. Uh, that was their preferred request. Um, but however, I was able to get a team in the next day at eight o'clock. And sometimes it happens and it, a miracle happens and that's great. <laughs> but sometimes it could be a little challenge, especially going over a weekend. Um, typically we can start that service on a Monday um, if for some reason we don't have the availability over the weekend. So it, it, it varies. But more than not, um, if they call right now, we can definitely start servicing because um, mm -hmm. our, our roster is pretty, pretty vast. Um, pretty deep, most, yeah. yeah, most home care agencies are pretty, pretty small. Um, but I think we're probably one, if not the only largest um, here in the Santa Fe area and the market for home care. So, mm -hmm. we, you know, we've been around for a while. Uh, obviously, this year will be 25 years. So we definitely have a name recognition, and we have definitely have built our caregiving team. And, and your uh, reputation on top of that, Jennifer. Thank I, you, I mean, Patrick. I, yeah. I will, I will um, just hammer that. We, we partner with a lot of uh, personal mm -hmm. care services. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that I'm, um, I'm going to be very circumspect here about if we start at the alphabet and we work our way down, we'd like to go, you know, that E is pretty much there at the top. And because of that response, because of the commitment, because of the ability, the advocacy and the ability and the, the resource to get, pull that trigger, get someone in the home. And so, yeah, and, and it probably took three hours. It wasn't an hour, but it took three, four hours, but, you know, they, they got someone in the home. So, yeah. and that's where we, and on our side, because it, it's all, when especially with it, when you say Amber Care, if somebody comes into the home that we recommend and they don't do well, well, guess what? We recommended them. And so we get tagged for that also. And so we want to make sure that same with our durable medical equipment, you know, providers with, you know, the pharmacies that we use, if we're not making sure that those individuals have the same advocacy focus, well, then it, it, it the patient and the patient's family suffer. Mm -hmm. And I, I know this sounds like a love fest, but I would say ditto back to you, Patrick, and your company, um, because we do work well and we do know your team well and you guys are responsive and you do mm -hmm. run with the ball pretty quickly. So that's why we enjoy working with you as well. So back at you. We love the collegiality and yes. yay to us that we got experts in the state. That's and the best. I have a question about, oh, Jeff, did you want to? Well, you mentioned in, in the state here. How about for our um, friends listening in in different parts of the country? Mm -hmm. So we have you two resources here uh, in, in Santa Fe and New Mexico. And now Patrick, Ambercare is a national company. So uh, I don't know how much they cover part of the country, but um, someone in other parts of the country, who do, they, who do they make a call to when they identify that um, we, we need to try and arrange for some assistance for someone? Jennifer, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking you were gonna answer first, sorry. Um, so we're independent and local. So our uh, areas of service is really the Santa Fe, um, market, which is the core of where our, our caregivers and our clients are, but we do radiate out to El Dorado, um, northern New Mexico, such as Los Alamos and White Rock. So since we're local and independent, we don't go beyond that area. So we're not a chain like the Amber Cares of the world, but um, but we, we do um, do this market and we do it well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Patrick, then how um in other parts of the country can they just go maybe online ember care or call or yeah, how yeah, do the, they find the internet you? is a is a beautiful tool you know it could be a blessing and a curse um amber care we're at his home care family so we are in new mexico we're in texas we're in oregon idaho virginia ohio illinois um that's hospice we have home health and pcs services in many more states so we've got a very broad um, nationwide focus. And that's 
that's one of the, the beauties of having that network, especially along the three service lines. Uh, however, but in your area, uh, do your internet search if you're able to do that. Look for those resources. And then of course, call the first two, three and find out how, and they're gonna get you dialed in because that's all the work that we're doing. Whether it's personal care, it's home health, we wanna get the right patient to the right resource. So if you say, how do I get personal care services or hospice in your area? Um, of course, we want you to go with us and, and, and locally want you to go with Aegis. Um, but if you're not in the area or you're not in New Mexico where you have us to be able to, uh, to resource with, you know, do those Google searches, find out what you need and then start making those calls and then find those advocacies because they're out there. And I think just to emphasize what Patrick is saying, we had Karen and Allison comment before, better, as Patrick said, to call the organization than to fill out um, online inquiries. You're going to get bombarded potentially um, and with calls from, you know, people you may not want to speak to so or have, you know, have your information. So find an organization online and reach out to them directly by phone. Thanks. Um, for, that's a great reminder that 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 stuck with me that they had yeah. shared with us before, too. Yeah, yeah, which is, as Patrick said, the Internet is great. And then, you know, it can be a minefield, mm -hmm. um, particularly yeah. for, you know, people who are in crisis who might not be thinking of looking for, um, you know, cybersecurity fraud or, you know, just dealing with those. That's not top of mind. People aren't thinking of those things in those moments. Um, I have a question might be an unusual one, but for male uh, clients or patients who might have a discomfort with um, being alone in their home with a woman, maybe they come, you know, from a more conservative um, background and, and they'd rather have male, a male nurse or caregiver. Do you have that um, staffing available? Yes, for Aegis, we do. Um, and that's one of the questions. Do they prefer a male or a female caregiver or either or is OK, you know, because it may be a point where, you know, the availability may be a little tight. And so, you know, that does come into play. So the care manager will ask that during the assessment and evaluation. And the, and typically they get a little profile of what you just said. They may come back from a conservative background. So they do ask those questions about their beliefs and things like that. So yes, that all comes into play. So, and yes, we can definitely staff it pretty much more so than not. Um, not to say there's times that we may cannot, but I, I would say more than yes. Mm -hmm. And with us, meeting those cultural, those belief systems, mm -hmm. um, obviously modesty, um, however that goes, we, we tailor the, the right caregiver for the patient and or the family. Because mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, the caregiver works well for the patient, but not for the family. And there has to be a right fit across the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we find that out all the time. Mm -hmm. And so we have to make sure that everyone's very comfortable who, who's coming in because it's your home, it's your home environment. Mm -hmm. It's, it's your, it's your power base. It's your, it's your safe space. And you have to have that right energy coming in there. Um, in your home. I mean, so yeah, we, we look at all of those things. I mean, it's a daily, uh, when, when in our clinical leaders, when they're assigning those caregivers and those teams to those patients, they look at all of those facets of that. Mm -hmm. I will, a client who's been through this um, personally with family members just sent some information, just a really helpful reminder um, to the out of state question. You can reach out to local senior centers um, and senior organizations and ask them, who do you recommend? Where can I start for in-home care, hospice care? Um, so that's a helpful tip. We appreciate it. I, you know, speaking of belief systems, I have a question that I realize might be controversial for some, um, but New Mexico is a state that has recently uh, uh, legalized dying with dignity. And I'm curious, I know, um, that there are rules around this in terms of how one goes about it. I know that the individual who is making the choice to die with dignity has to self-administer the medication. I'm curious from each of you, and particularly with hospice, I think, Patrick, you might address this um, first. Um, how does 
are there rules around whether the hospice caregiver or any caregivers, I know they can't administer, but can they be present, particularly if we're looking at an individual who's alone, maybe they don't have family or friends who are there, can the hospice caregiver be present with them when they take the medication? Yes. Um, so this, this law, uh, and, and I'll, we've had intimate um, um, relations with the inception of this law and as it's been acted. Amber Care um, had the first patient in the state of New Mexico, uh, in the northern New Mexico region. Um, and so we have, um, and because we have a very large uh, New Mexico uh, reach, uh, we've done several of these. Um, and we're going to go with the death of a dignity, right? Mm -hmm. And there's another layer that comes with that, and that's dignity affirming. Mm -hmm. This is the patient's choice. This is how they want to go ahead and manage their care. So I can only speak to what we do at Amber Care, um, but we will not ever leave that patient alone. Mm -hmm. From the beginning, and, and even from the beginning of the, the start of care or the admission onto hospice, as they make that decision. And because this is something that's also baked into the law is we have to be very forthright. We have to be educational with getting patients and family members to the right resources um, with um, the Death Through Dignity Coalition, getting them um, connected with the right provider in order to make those overtures. And then when the provider comes in now, there's a certain thing about this because it's a New Mexico law, it's not a federal law mm -hmm. and because we predominantly, like I told you earlier, 98% um, of our um, insurance is Medicare, Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a very delicate dance. So our providers, our hospice providers do not um, write for the medications, nor do they administer them. And that's a, that's a conscious decision that Amber Care has decided mm -hmm. to take. And I think it's a very, very um, profound decision to make. We will get you um, dialed in with the right provider that will come in, write the medications, do the assessments, and are administer the medications. But Amercare, it, we won't do that. And, and just to be clear for those who aren't aware, um, I do want to say that if you're not familiar with the law, um, dementia patients cannot self-administer. No. One has to be um, cognitively aware to make the decision to request the care. There is a litany of steps you have to go through with your physician, and then you have to be aware enough to be able to administer. So just yes. for that clarity. Yeah. So at the, at the sign, at the, at the time that you sign up two days later, there's a, there's a minimum waiting period. Um, right. and then at the time of the ingestion, you have to be decisional. You have to be cognizant. Right. Right. So you could sign up and say, I'm going to, you know, I want to, I want to go this route. And then you wait, you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks, okay. then the patient's no longer decision. It's, it's not. And, and that's why it's a very, very fast process. Right. Um, and, and to a certain extent, we've had a large amount of patients that have elected to use this um, benefit that's to them in the state of New Mexico. And it's very, very, very rapid. And it's also very difficult for our teams because um, we want to spend, you know, four months, five months, six months, getting to know you, getting to know your family, getting to know your caregivers to be able to move that. And sometimes it doesn't happen, but that's, it's very difficult for our teams also. Yeah. But yeah, but we will always be there. So that, that back to that, coming back to the, in the, the original question is, the other provider will come in, they will administer the medications. We won't be part of that, but we will always be there until your last breath. And Thank then we will assist that. with preparation of the body, getting them off to the funeral home of, uh, of their choice. And then that, and then of course the bereavement follow-up that comes with that. Because it, there's, there's also, I wanna be very, very clear too is, um, and, and someone will ask about this, well, what goes on the death certificate? It's their, hospice admitting diagnosis it's not physician to suicide it's not you know suicide mm. it's it's okay see what i'm saying that's that's yeah. the quantum part. see it's and and when you're on hospice so you don't have to be in hospice in order to um, take advantage of this new law you do need to have two physicians two independent independent physicians that certify that you are terminally um have a terminal diagnosis 
and then you go that route. But if you're on hospice in New Mexico, you automatically meet the criteria. Okay. So then the, the independent physician will come in and they will, second physician will come in and they will make the, the final certification and then you go. I think we have one minute left, Jeff. Did you want to wrap up or was there anything you wanted to add here at I, the end? I, I, I thought of one, one story I, I, I should tell. So this is for folks listening that even if you have an opportunity to, to uh, arrange for in-home care, and this is with a client that here in Santa Fe and her father was in Texas and he had dementia. And so she would go and arrange for in-home care. Everything's great. She'd come back home. She'd call. He fired everybody. And so, um, and yep. so she went through this multiple times. And so it's just a reminder that even if you arrange for in-home services, it's it's not the end. <laughs> it's it's you're you're beginning the process. Um, okay, you didn't so, want it. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Um, you got a choice. You so have a choice. Yeah, thanks so much for today, for the conversation on in-home in care and resources that you can access. Uh, this is just a reminder, next we're gonna have a, a, a workshop on dementia and then following that also on Medicare and eligibility and services. We're, we're so grateful to the professionals, the experts in this, this area that do it every day, Jennifer Reek with Aegis and Patrick Salas with Amber Care. Um, you're welcome to reach out to them. Also, if you have questions for them, you can go through us, whatever is the best way to, to contact anyone. And we will have this uh, video up uh, shortly on our, our website as well for everyone. Um, thanks, I'm, I'm very appreciative and humbled by your, your knowledge and expertise in this area. We thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank thanks. you very much. Okay.